All right, if I could have your attention again, it's uh, time to introduce our next, our next panelist, Pamela McClung Casto, or Pam Casto, as many people know her, a fellow Morgantown resident. She has a master's degree in secondary science education, a bachelor's in medical technology from WVU. She has also completed uh, graduate courses in science, technology, and education at other institutions such as Marshall University, Wheeling uh, Jesuit University, and Ohio University. Her archaeology experience includes the Kearns Fort Project, which is just not far from my neighborhood there in Morgantown and in Pam's neighborhood. She'll be addressing that today. Uh, she's also worked with Scotland's Episcopal Palaces Project with the University of Wales, and she was sharing some of those experiences uh, with us last night. The Orchard Site Project and numerous others. She has trained students in archaeology field work in Scotland, England, and the good old US. She is currently with Fairmont State University College of Science and Technology, serving as a NASA Education Specialist at NASA's Independent Verification and Validations Education Resource Center. Please welcome Pam Casto to the lectern. So I want to begin by first thanking two of the panelists up here because I had been an educator most of my life teaching biology, chemistry, and physics. And then one day appeared in my mailbox at school a brochure that said, hey, the Hopewell Cultural Park in Chillicothe is having a teachers in archaeology program. Come join us for two weeks and learn about archaeology and how you can use it in your classroom. And so that program was um, directed by Jared Burks and Jennifer Peterson at the park there. And so I thought, oh, that sounds like a lot of fun. I'll go do that. And I became involved in the world of archaeology in a big way. It was so exciting. And what I learned at that particular um, professional development for teachers that summer evolved into a second part-time career for me. And is why I've got to do all these wonderful projects. And then as I became involved with that and led students and teachers in West Virginia to do various archaeology projects, Darla became a good mentor for me as she mentored me on the orchard site and other things that I became interested in. So I want to give them a thanks because it's because of them that I'm kind of here today. So Kearns Fort, um, the latest thing that I've been involved with um, is uh, a surprise too. You may live next to a famous archaeology site for five years and never know it. This block fort was one block from my house and I did not know it was there for five years. And this came about because um, our youngest son decided to go to WVU and then to dental school at WVU and rather than lose money for all those years uh, to room and board at a dorm or an apartment, we bought a small house over in the Greenmont section, uh, South Park area kind of, of Morgantown for him to live in. And he happened to have two greyhounds. And when we would go up and visit on the weekends, my husband and I would get the job of walking the greyhounds to give him a break. And I would walk them by this place a block from our house that had a marker out in front. And the marker happens to say that um, this was the site of a fort built in 1774. And I thought, oh, how nice. Over 200 years ago, there used to be a fort at this site. And for five years, I thought that. And then one day while I was walking by, you can see in the background there a big stone house. The lady who owned the stone house was out in her yard and she and I began talking and I found out no, there didn't used to be a fort at this site. There still was a fort at this site. The exterior had just been covered in the 1800s by white clapboards that she had since painted a nice cranberry color and but it was still the original building. And so I started doing research about it because I was fascinated uh, and hardly anyone in the area seemed to know that that was the original fort still standing there. And it turns out that 
It seems to indicate this building was built in 1772 by Michael Kern. We'll hear a little bit more about him in a minute. And then in 1774, uh, during the time around Lord Dunmore's War and pre-Revolutionary War, um, this area was under siege sometimes by the Delawares and the Mingos who were kind of siding with the British. So Michael Kern, around his main fortified house here, put up a huge stockade. And this became Kern's Fort, and people from the area, whenever there was a threat, um, would come to this fort and either live right outside the walls or right inside the walls. And at times, it's been recorded, there was as many as 80 people associated with this. And the um, mentions of it in early records that in the West Virginia Regional History Collection say that it was one of the largest forts in the area. So I called the McBrides and said, what's a large fort? <laughs> and they said, oh, well, large ones were usually about 100 feet on a side. And so the, in the basement of this stone house, there is a spring that was said to be inside the stockade walls of the fort, which was why people like to congregate at this particular fort in the area. And so, because it had a constant supply of fresh spring water inside the stockade. And sure enough, if I pretended that this was the center of the fort, and we really have no idea whether it was along one of the walls or in the center, because we don't know where the stockade boundaries were, but that would put the spring that is in this house um, within the stockade walls, within a 100 foot um, uh, stockade wall. This is the exterior back of the fort, and it shows um, an addition um, that occurred sometime after the original fort was built, and this little addition today is the, the kitchen, and this little back porch was added about that time too. And in a moment later on, you're going to see we did a shovel test pit right off this corner back here, and you'll see some of the results of that shovel test pit. But you can see the old foundation here, and in matching this foundation up with the foundation in the front of the fort, you can tell it's of a later age, but it's still a very early foundation. This is the interior of the fort. This is what it looked like on the outside before they covered it up with the white clapboards in the 1800s. You can see the original chestnut walls still with the broad ax marks in them. And what's even more amazing, so these, these are 70, 1772 broad ax marks. That ax was saved by Michael Kearns who built the fort and passed on to his children and grandchildren who donated it to the WVU Regional Library Commission. And you can still see the broad ax that made these marks uh, and up at WVU at the WVU libraries. So that's really cool too. On this side, right here and here, are what the original, uh, the owner of the fort nowadays says are gun ports, that before the stockade was added, that these round holes here were used um, as gun ports uh, to defend, if he would have had to defend this uh, fortified house. Um, I don't know because I've never really seen an actual gun port in an original structure, so I don't know. They seem kind of funny to me. I'm not sure that that's what they are, but that's the story that I got from the present owner. Um, so basically, this is just background information on Michael Kern, his family. Um, uh, grandparents and parents kind of left the, the area in Germany around the Rhine River when there were some religious wars going on there in the early 1700s, made their way to Holland and from Holland to the United States where they then eventually kept traveling south. Um, we have the ship records where they came over on and uh, some of the families that came over with them followed Michael Kearns down to present day West Virginia in the Morgantown area and are uh, in courthouse records in uh, Mon County. Um, we know that while he was in Pennsylvania, he stopped at his uncle's fort 
uh, fortified house and grist mill there where he learned to build mills. And when he came on to West Virginia, what is now West Virginia, and built a fort, he became the owners of the first mills in the area. He built a grist mill on um, Decker's Creek right below his fortified house that you saw. And he also built the first boat docks. And this summer and next summer, the Morgantown History Commission is um, recreating the flatboats that he built using the techniques from that time. It's going to be a cooperative project that we're doing with uh, part of the forestry department at WVU and various other people. Um, and this just shows when he originally got there, he got a track of 400 acres and it went up to 800 acres at various time. He expanded his land ownings clear into Marion and Harrison County over time. He was one of the people who laid out the street pattern of Morgantown today. And this is where it's located from, if you look at a Google map. Uh, this is the fort right here. And this is the large house of the people who own the fort. And one interesting thing here, when we were trying to figure out where the stockade would have been around this fort, if you know the present, look at the present day grid marks, they're nice, all uh, continuous um, square things, except at the fort. The street that comes down by the fort ends abruptly at the end of uh, where the spring was inside this house and curves this way and does not continue down and we don't know why that happened. Was there something here in the past that prevented them from continuing this street on down? Why did they take this street and take it down over this way and not continue it the way the entire rest of the area is laid out? So that, that was kind of interesting. Uh, this is my house right here. So I'm um, diagonally across from the fort. And as I said, for five years, walked right by it and never knew it was there. Um, that's just more about the lands he owned. Um, this is from the McBride's book that lists the forts that they uh, encountered information about in the area. And in my brief research that I've done on Kern's Fort, um, I found that Kern's Fort and Coburn's Fort uh, the people from these two forts interacted with each other a lot. They're often mentioned in the same documents and at the same time. And when Coburn's fort burnt down, um, the people, a lot of the people from that fort came over and stayed uh, with Kern's fort. And we actually have letters of people who lived at Kern's fort who went over when this fort was burning and recorded what they saw. Um, in early documents, one of the earliest documents that we have um, of, about Kern's Fort is a letter from a child who was in the fort uh, in, during Revolutionary War times. And as, when he grew up and was about 70 years old, he wrote a letter to his cousin who had asked him, what was life like living there? And so we have this long letter that, gave, that gives details of what he remembers from living in the fort which is really cool. And these are some of the things he remembers. Um, he remembers that when the war broke out, his whole family who was at a nut, living near another fort moved to the Kearns Fort area because it had that supply of water, it had plenty of areas around the fort for food growing and et cetera. And he described it as a stockaded fort that at one time had a, a company of soldiers there. And I can find no records of that, but there were traveling militia bands that would stay at forts occasionally in the, uh, during those times. So maybe while he was there at one time for maybe a period of months or weeks, there was some militia there. But there wasn't a, um, a specific detachment of militia ever assigned to that as a fort. It was a private uh, fort. Um, and he was, I think he was about uh, eight or nine years old when he watched the burning of Coburn's fort and talks about that. And right around the time the fort burned, there, were, there was a, a skirmish between two men and some Native Americans and they were killed. And the men from Kern's fort went out 
and uh, brought them back to the fort. And he remembers it so vividly, he says, because they brought them in the way you would bring in a dead deer. They had tied the men's arms and feet together and then ran a pole through that and had carried them in um, that way on their backs from wherever it was that they had found them. Oh, excuse me. Um, he also records that small, while they were all living there in the fort during those times, uh, and at one point we have some indications there was as many as 80 people living either within the fort walls or right around the fort walls that used the fort for protection. Uh, smallpox came through, and he remembers two of the children dying of smallpox, and that six of the eight Negroes in the fort died. And there is um, records showing in the Mon County Courthouse showing that Michael Kearns did own slaves at that time. And um, so it's kind of funny because two sources I found, one said they died of smallpox and another one said that they died of mysterious circumstances. It was probably the smallpox, I would think. but. Uh, and he talked about he and his brother hunting ramps on the hogback. And those of you who live in Morgantown, that hogback turn is still there and it's still called the hogback today. And um, he talked about seeing um, Colonel John Evans, who was a local militia guy, um, being struck by an arrow when they were all out practicing shooting arrows one day in the wrist. And he talked about where Morgantown, downtown Morgantown is today is where they had their cornfields. Um, some other early events in the life of the fort, um, Bald Eagle was a friendly Indian who had visited the fort a lot and in retaliation to something happening and I don't even know what it was, um, some men, three men killed Bald Eagle, put a piece of Johnny cake in his mouth, put him afloat in a canoe on the Mon River there. And we've talked about the burning of Coben's fort. Uh, George Rogers Clark stopped at this fort and took 20 men from the fort with him when he went on his famous expedition against the British. And um, then the deaths that we talked about. Now, in addition to the smallpox deaths and the two killed by Indians, Michael Kern himself, who um, after the Revolutionary War, um, some years after it, built a beautiful home in downtown Morgantown that's now at the end of High Street and is a funeral home. and. Um, his, one of his children continued living in the original Kearns Fort for many, many years. And so Michael Kern himself, when he died, was buried according to records in the All House, which is a, a historical house associated with um, research place associated with the public library. Um, he was buried between Arch and Cherry Streets. But that's kind of funny because Arch and Cherry Streets meet at a 45 degree angle. And so how can you be buried between them unless he was buried on the point of land? So, but we do not know, I don't know where his grave is now. We don't know where any of these graves were since they were all living in the fort um, <clears throat> for protection at that time. We assume the graves are very, very close to the fort. And you saw in that map that after the stockade walls were taken down after the Revolutionary War, the town of Morgantown eventually grew up around that fort. So those graves are likely in someone's backyard there in the Greenmont area of Morgantown. Um, Francis Asbury, now when I talked to the people at the WVU libraries, they told me that he spoke at Kearns Fort. But in, by 1788, Michael Kearns had built a chapel, so he may have been speaking in Michael Kearns' chapel, not the fort. But he wrote in his journals that are, that are still uh, in existence that he had a lifeless, disorderly people to hear me at Morganstown. And he went on to say, it's a matter of grief to behold the excesses, particularly in drinking, which abound here. So even in 1788, Morgantown had a reputation <laughs> for <laughs> drinking. <laughs> and so he visited, in his diaries, he visited Morgan's town uh, on several occasions. But this is one that I found that was rather funny. 
Um, in the 1800s, Waitman T. Willie, who is uh, associated with a famous house in Morgantown and who was active in uh, forming uh, the government of West Virginia, uh, spoke at the for Kearns Fort. So it was still actively being used for public events in 1833 and 1834. And they had a, a respected veteran of the Revolutionary War speak at the f fort, Mr. Evan Morgan, who read the Declaration of Independence at that time. And in the 1900s, the only really significant thing I could find um, is in October of 1927, they placed that bronze marker that I used to try to keep the Greyhounds from wetting. And that is the bronze marker that's on the corner. Uh, the Daughters of the American Revolution put that marker there. There's also a funny story associated with that. They decided that the bronze plate needed cleaning, so a DAR member came and took the bronze plate off and sent it off for cleaning, but she forgot to tell anyone. So the owner of the fort in the, in the big house there reported it stolen to the police, and it was in the headlines in the Morgantown paper and everything, and the lady was just mortified, and she had to call the police and say, oh, it's not stolen, I'm not going to get in trouble, am I? I just took it for cleaning. <laughs> but. So now we get the archaeology record, the Kearns Fort archaeology record. Um, Jared, as part of a summer, I do summer camps for teachers uh, through NASA every year, and one of the summer camps we decided to do, I had to get my archaeology in, because now that I'm working full-time for NASA, I don't have as much time off to do neat, longer projects like I used to do <clears throat> in the summers when I taught. Um, so we did a, a professional development camp on the electromagnetic spectrum, and we learned how NASA uses um, radio waves and microwaves and infrared waves and all of this stuff to study things out in space like black holes and galaxies and uh, other planets in the solar system. But we also use those wavelengths to do geophysical archaeology. And so I applied to the Space Grant Consortium uh, there at WVU and they gave me a grant to put on this week-long summer camp. And then my NASA facility threw in a bunch of money for me. And so I said, one day we're going to spend looking how um, those wavelengths are used here on Earth. So we brought Jared in. He gave the teachers at the camp a great presentation on geophysical archaeology. And then he brought his, um, uh, one of his GPR machines down, and he taught them to do um, ground penetrating radar there. And they did the grounds in front of the fort, to the side of the fort, and in um, an empty lot across from the fort. And so this is what they uncovered directly in front of the house. There is, uh, out from the front door part of the house, there is um, some unknown thing. In the empty lot next to that fort and the, the next house down the street, um, there seems to be a possible stone wall. In the area across from the house, now this is perhaps the most interesting thing, um, down at this level, and when we did our um, shovel test pit right off the back porch there, um, the few 1,700 artifacts we uncovered appeared between 70 and 78 centimeters down before we hit um, a subsoil. So at 72 to 70, seven centimeters down across from the fort, we have this line of circular possible large post holes. And if you look at the display that I had the teachers gather information for and create so that I could take it around to various places <laughs> out front, um, you'll see um, uh, a runoff picture of a type of stockade that was built around some of these forts where they would dig a deep hole every so many feet and put a large post in and then a little shallow trench with more smaller saplings or palings or something between the larger ones. And so we were wondering if this is a possibility for that. But it's at an angle and I'm so, uh, I don't know, uh, I would think that if you had a fort house that you would make line up the walls of your fort 
perpendicular you know, to the house and be a nice square around it. But these would actually turn out to be at an angle from the main fortified house. So we're really not sure, but maybe. This is what um, the radar slice actually looked at as the students were pushing it across. This is what they were seeing. And these reflections here are those post holes and these are meters apart, so they were about three feet apart. This one seemed to go down much deeper than the others. Maybe, Jared said, perhaps um, a cistern or well turned out to be existing at that point now. Um, those are the teachers screening the dirt from the shovel test pit. And again, you can see the spring uh, that fed the fort is in the basement here, and there's a nice stone straw stone trough, and we have a picture taken. This house was built in the 1920s. We have a picture taken shortly after the 1900s that shows just a little wooden structure built over the spring. And that's some of um, the uh, artifacts from the shovel test pit. This one here is, seems to be the oldest ceramic we have that's possibly 1700s. Um, this is some red ware, uh, some bones with butcher marks on them, and then a, a, a clay pipe stem. I was so amazed when one of the teachers pulled that out and goes, what's this? And I went, oh, because I've seen thousands of these on my digs over in Scotland and England. And I, I was going, it's a, it's a clay pipe stem. <laughs> and then just various types of glass from 1800s to modern. Uh, and of course, lots of corroded nails. And then last summer, um, because the city of Morgantown, this generated enough interest and in articles in the paper, the city of Morgantown is now in active discussions to buy this from the private owners. And Bow Park is wanting to turn it into a small park, park for the town, for Greenmont, and eventually, um, uh, uh, make it into a nice little historical park there. So the next summer, because they were in di discussions, um, the ladies' lawyers didn't particularly want us doing anything on the property. So we went in my backyard and my neighbor's backyards and did a couple shovel test pits <laughs> for the fun of it one afternoon with my uh, teachers from that summer's camp. And we found some handmade clay marbles um, that are oxidizing. They seem to have copper in them. And oh, the other things we found that summer, uh, we found a whole lot of post-Civil War uh, pharmaceutical glass directly across from the fort in a field. Um, so what further studies could be done? I would like to find some early maps that show that Greenmont area because I can't find any. The earliest maps I have are like almost the 1900s, and I can't find any late 1700s or early 1800 maps of that area. Because at one time in the 1800s, they put the county fairgrounds over there in front, and of, in front of where the fort is, and they created a horse track. And there is a letter that we have of one lady complaining that they moved some graves to get that horse track in. And she was complaining because they showed no respect for our historical dead. And she said that they moved them to the back of the fairground. But we had no idea where the fairground was. And um, so that's kind of interesting. I would like to have people uh, uh, record. There's still plenty of people who are around who tell stories about the Kearns family and their living there. And to search for more information, like down in the Marion County Historical Society, they have lots of references to Mon County to see if there's anything about the fort in the in those areas. And then maybe find, see if we can find out what the original boundaries of the fort are someday. And I'd like to thank all of these people who uh, I used material from them, from um, uh, including the McBride's Frontier Forts in West Virginia, which has become one of my favorite books. <laughs> and uh, Sorry, it's out of print. <laughs> I have two copies. <laughs> so, uh, any questions? Yes.
the um, old house that you said Kearns built at the base of High Street that's now a funeral home, is that Daring's funeral home? Yes. Thank you. And what's the name of that street? Is it uh, Foundry? Foundry yes. Street that the old uh, Daring's funeral, or the Daring's funeral home uh, is on was the home of Michael Kearns, right? That's where right. he left the fort. All right, any other questions on this Kearns Fort exploration? Well, let's take a, a quick vote here. Um, we can take a, a break, or if, uh, did, how, raise your hand if you're in favor of taking a break, getting some more coffee, and all right. <laughs> so let's, let's take a break and be back here at 10, or excuse me, 11.40, and we'll resume with our two more uh, panelists before lunch. Thank you. And, and you can see the Kearns Fort display out in the lobby. And uh, Pam just reminded us there's a display out on a table in the lobby of Kearns Fort. Uh, there are also some free items you can pick up. So we'll see you right back here in 10 minutes. <laughs>